Welcome to today's webcast brought to you by DataVail. I'm Stephen Fagg, Director of Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, The Cloud Adoption Industry Benchmark, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, all viewers today will be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for participating. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Dan Russell, Senior Vice President of Cloud Strategy and Alliances at DataVail. Now, I'm going to pass the event over to Dan. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate that, and welcome to the webinar today. I hope you find the material that we share today to be extremely helpful. Um, just as a little bit of background, I have been in the industry for over 20 years. I have both a business and an IT background. So I've worked on both uh, business strategies and IT strategies, more recently helping companies with their cloud strategies. I also have a background in apps, infrastructure, and analytics, so pretty broad background. And I've worked with pretty much all size companies and all the different industry verticals throughout my career. Um, today, the primary purpose of the call is to um, talk about you know, some things I think might be on your brain relative to the cloud and cloud computing and to utilize a combination of the survey that many of you took and the results of that survey, along with some trends that we see in the industry and some best practices. So some of the questions that I hope that we will help you address are, you know, what are the trends in the industry for cloud today? You know, how does your company compare to others? And we'll do that through the benchmark so you can kind of see where you are in your cloud journey compared to most of the others relative to, you know, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid, um, with, um, you know, leverage of PaaS or SaaS or IaaS and different things like that. We'll also talk about some of the trends and the survey relative to database analytics and business applications, and also cost, which is one of the key things that people are always curious about relative to the cloud. So now let me start with a couple of uh, baseline uh, metrics. Um, pretty Many sources would all quote the number to be about here, but the, the feeling is in the U.S. about 30% of all workloads in the U.S. are in the cloud today, in the public cloud today. So while cloud has been adopted by quite a few companies, not everybody's gone all in. So about 30% of the workloads are there today. Gartner estimates that in two years, by the end of 2022, 75% of all databases will be deployed or migrated to a cloud platform. So that's quite a bit of growth from where we stand today. So that's how fast the industry is going to continue to evolve. We look at, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of share with you, this is kind of the Dan Russell view of the cloud um, and how it has evolved through the years. And it's starts to tie into how clients and companies have chosen to leverage the cloud. So really, cloud computing's been around much longer than 1999, but it really didn't start to gain traction until Salesforce was launched in 1999. And as everybody knows, they have come from a startup company to the world's largest CRM, CRM company. Um, Workday followed with their HR application in about 2004, and the success of Workday started to eat into the HR applications of Oracle, PeopleSoft, um, SAP, et cetera. Once those two companies started to gain enough traction, you started to see the large uh, providers of legacy on-prem software suites um, start to rapidly develop their cloud versions of their software and introduce it in modules over time. So that would be Oracle moving to their Oracle uh, SaaS offerings, Microsoft moving their Office 365 from on-prem perpetual to the cloud, Microsoft then doing the same thing with their Dynamics portfolio, SAP with their uh, business application portfolio. There are many other SaaS providers, I just mentioned the big ones that really set the stage. And now almost every software company is going cloud first with subscription-based models. 
um, even the smaller ones are now migrating their on-prems to the cloud. In 2006, Amazon really started to change the game with uh, public cloud when they launched AWS. And then Microsoft launched Azure in about 2010, so about four years later. And Google Cloud actually was launched about the same time as Azure, 2009, 2010, um, but it wasn't as readily adopted. And then Oracle um, put together their Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI, and made it available um, after that. And it, early on, companies mostly were using cloud as compute. So it was instead of having your, your workloads running in your local data centers or in a, lo or, or in a hosted environment or a colo environment, and usually companies chose to do a lift and shift of their workloads. Um, what was found though is that the workloads didn't always perform as well in the cloud as people thought they would. So you started seeing all the cloud providers um, work on enhancements to their platforms to optimize performance. You know, in my eyes, AWS is the most advanced there where they've launched a lot of pass offerings to optimize performance of each of the individual workloads that you see depicted here. Azure has since launched their um, pass offering for SQL Server, um, and now they can host some of the other platforms. And then Google Cloud, um, most of their work has been, not all, but a high percentage, their focus has been in the analytics space. And Oracle's focus has been predominantly on their business applications and optimizing the performance of Oracle workloads in the Oracle Cloud. We started to see the path um, adoption by clients rapidly grow. But in 2018, we saw a huge shift. Um, Databell is in the business of supporting clients, databases, analytics, and business applications. And we've been in business for about 15 years. So what we saw was a huge uptick in 2018 of clients no longer were just looking at lifting and shifting their workloads, but they now wanted to know how to optimize the performance of each workload. So clients then were looking for, okay, what's my best way to handle my SQL Server workloads? What about my Oracle workloads? What about Mongo, MySQL, et cetera? And so that movement really gained momentum in, in 2018. In 2019, we really started seeing some of the database modernizations to take place. Um, Amazon announced RDS in about 2009, and then they announced Aurora in 2014, and Microsoft announced Azure SQL in 2010, although it wasn't as readily adopted at that point in time. And then Mongo, um, one of the newer database platforms, but one of the fastest growing, was announced in 2007 as a document database, and now it's it's grown quite substantially um, in, in the industry and in the market for some specific use cases. So in 2019 is when we really saw this database modernization trend start to, to gain some momentum, and more than some of the early adopters, it started to becoming more common for people to evaluate modernizing their data platforms. And then 2020, um, while analytics and cloud native applications had been around for a while, we saw a huge uptick in the demand for cloud analytics and clients wanting to use the cloud platforms for their data lakes and their repositories. I have the big, the four biggest ones that are most common out there listed here, Amazon's Redshift, Snowflake, um, Oracle's uh, Autonomous Cloud, and then uh, Azure Data Lakes. And on the right, you see the two you know, most Companies use either the .NET stack or the Java or a combination of both for the foundation for building their, their cloud native applications. You know, everybody wants to know, well, what's moving to the cloud, but also what's not moving to the cloud. Um, the things that we see as slower moving to the cloud are your legacy transaction, your large legacy transactional systems. A lot of the big mainframe based apps, especially in the financial service industry, have been built and optimized for years running on mainframes, and those have been much slower to move to the cloud. Um, companies have withheld some of their highly sensitive data security uh, applications in movement, but I can tell you that the cloud providers have done a great job of building out very robust security, so we're starting to see that as no longer a constraint to moving to the cloud. And then if people have legacy client server applications where the, the clients were thick, 
So there was a lot of data latency between the back end server and the cloud and the client front end on prem. Some of those have not moved very quickly. And then on the manufacturing shop floor, there's a lot of real time shop shop floor controller systems that are still predominantly running on prem um, to support the um, the operations of their of their plant force. I thought it'd be helpful to share with you a little bit about the size of the market and the market share that each of the big players have. So Amazon by far was the first to announce, but they've also been the fastest to grow. And they have about 40% of the market today. In 2020, they'll, they'll exceed uh, $45 billion. So that's a huge um, market. Azure, uh, Microsoft is running about 23% of the market share. Um, this year, they'll exceed just over 25 billion. Google has about 12% of the current market, and they're uh, just under 15 billion. And Oracle and IBM, in spite of their efforts and their investments in their cloud infrastructures, they're not seeing much growth. Today, they each own about 2% of the market. There are some offshore Chinese-based companies that are not on this diagram, but this is pretty much the, the cloud providers that are being adopted in, in the U.S. market today. So now let's switch and we'll, we're going to start to talk about the survey that many of you all filled out. So first, I wanted to highlight um, who responded. We had almost 200 companies respond. The pie on the left kind of shows you the breakdown. It's almost a third of large enterprises, a third of it was small business, just over 20% were medium enterprises that are between 200 million and a billion, and about 10% were government. Most of those were state and local organizations, uh, a few educational. And over on the right, you see the industry verticals that were represented. It's pretty a pretty good sample of the overall industry mix within the US. So our survey sample is a pretty uh, reflective of, of the US market as a whole. So now let's talk about what are the top reasons that people are moving to the cloud. So per the survey results, each of you had a chance to click multiple options. And what we have done is we have just used a bar graph here to show how many people responded. So of the 200 respondents, almost half the people picked IT efficiency. Um, the next biggest was flexible capacity, which is really what people think of the cloud, right? The ability to scale up or scale down your capacity. The next is business continuity. A lot of people want the higher availability that comes with public cloud computing with the uh, multi-regions and availability zones. You know, that allows you to have that to where you can have much more robust disaster recovery. Um, unfortunately, with COVID this year, many people having to move their workers remote, um, some of the people that did not have cloud-based systems and cloud-based disaster recovery put put a strain on some of their environments. And I think some of the benefits started to, to shine at that point in time. Then the, the next three were IT capacity on demand. So you think of the time it takes for you to provision a new server or new storage in your own hosted data center versus in the cloud, you're talking minutes to spin up a new environment in the cloud. Um, which kind of feeds the, the last one in the box there, which is ability to launch products and services quickly um, by leveraging you know, your um, uh, cloud environments that can be more rapidly provisioned. And then you know, capital savings is also in the uh, top six along with cost savings on the expense side. So those are your, your big trends um, based upon the survey respondents. And this is pretty consistent with what we see in the overall market as a whole. So now let's look at where companies are in their cloud journeys, and you can think about your own business, about where you fit. You know, almost 70% of the companies today, almost 70% of the companies today are already running some workloads in the cloud. 10% have moved 100% in the cloud, or their business is cloud native. 60% are hybrid cloud, so they have a combination of workloads in the cloud or on-prem. 20% are still evaluating, and 10% have not started that evaluation process. Um, the other thing that we did is we ran some analysis based upon the survey on size of company. Um, large enterprises have moved more aggressively to the cloud. Um, state and local has moved the slowest to the cloud. 
And then the medium and small enterprises ha are more likely to go with a single um, private cloud provider or public cloud provider than they are multi-cloud. The large enterprises tend to lean on multi-cloud a little bit more. You know, one of the reasons is the large enterprises um, want to be careful about putting all of their eggs in one basket and have some ability to move their workloads between multiple cloud providers. And then another reason many clients use multi-cloud is you might buy a SaaS product like Salesforce or Microsoft Office 365, and you don't get to select the cloud that that runs in, but then you might launch some of your own workloads in like AWS, for example. So many companies end up in a hybrid or a multi-cloud environment um, based upon that. And this chart kind of depicts that. So today about 47% of the companies are running on multiple cloud platforms. 24% are on a single public cloud. And then your private cloud today is only about 25% of the market. Some of that's hosted um, in a uh, colo or a, or a private cloud location. Um, and some of it is in your on-prem data centers. The usage of private cloud we see is decreasing as the public cloud has greatly improved on their security and some of the other benefits with their past offerings. The, what you get in the private cloud, the gap between that and the public cloud is widening. So many more companies are moving towards uh, public cloud today. So what are the challenges? You know, cloud computing's not easy. It, can't, it does add some complexity, um, and it, but the benefits way outweighed some of the challenges. So some of the challenges that you each of you highlighted in the survey, you know, the system and application integration was number one. Skilled resources on your teams to be conversant in how to leverage the cloud and able to keep, keep pace with all of the enhancements that the cloud providers are, are introducing on a rapid pace in their past offerings. Um, increased cost was number three as a challenge. Security, number four, um, that also ties directly into compliance. The increased complexity, so while you're moving some compute out of your local data centers, there is some added complexity in um, your cloud architecture. I think it's probably less complex than your legacy on-prem, but it's just different than what your internal teams are usually used to. And then um, six, six, number six on the list was lack of a defined cloud strategy, and uh, seven was a combination of performance and latency. So now in the survey, you know, one of the questions was, how did the cost compare? I think there's a perception in the market. You have two schools of camp. One school says, hey, my cloud computing has saved me money. But then once I get there, does it really save me money? Um, almost 50% of the people say that they are getting the, the costs are about in line with what their expectations were, with most of those expecting to decrease their costs. About 25% are saying that the costs are actually higher than what we expected and 10% less. And a few of you haven't really benchmarked your costs before and after. There are some best practices that you can leverage um, to try to optimize your cloud consumption and your cloud bills. Um, one that each of you are probably already facing is it switches your IT um, financials from more of a CapEx environment to an OpEx. And so each of your businesses, I'm sure, are going through that as your budgets are built each year as you're leveraging the cloud, both for your infrastructure and for your software as software is moving to a uh, subscription base. Um, but the best thing that each of you can do is to monitor your cloud consumption. And there's some really good monitoring tools out there, some provided by the, the public cloud providers and some third party tools that will allow you to monitor the consumption and to identify that consumption by workload and by business function so you can see who's consuming the resources that have been provisioned. It also helps you to monitor and decide when you can um, dial down some of your cloud environments to optimize the, the costs and the, and the consumption. Um, another best practice is to constantly be monitoring that to scale up and scale down to align the capacity with your business needs. Um, and then I already mentioned leveraging the tools. And then a final thing that um, many of you are probably already doing, but some of you might not think about doing, is leveraging reserved in instances. 
where you get a pretty significant discount on pre-buying capacity, but you're committed to that capacity for, for some period of time. Um, any workloads that are very stable where you know you're going to have the consumption are ideal candidates to look to using reserved instances to drive down some of your cloud costs. What workloads are moving to the cloud? We get this question quite a bit. And according to the survey itself, you know, the top workloads that are, are the most popular workloads that are moving are database, analytics, and web content hosting. You can see what some of the others are over on the left-hand side. You know, CRM obviously is a high one. IoT starting to move rapidly to the cloud because of the scaling and the volume of data. Um, DevOps is, is very uh, popular these days, mobile applications, and, and, and you can see further up the, the bar chart how some of the other workloads are scaling. So now let's talk about your applications. Um, one of the things that's extremely important as you start to plan your migration to the cloud is to look at your portfolio of business applications, and we call it the six R's, um, retire, retain, rehost, replatform, repurchase, and refactor. And so with each application, you wanna look and decide what's the right way to handle that application. Anything that's gonna be sunsetted, usually no need to move it to the cloud, leave it on-prem until you sunset it. Um, some are gonna retain and run long-term. We mentioned some of the types of workloads that aren't moving, that would be your retain category. You know, when the cloud first started to pick up steam in the IS space, there was a lot of rehosting, still is today. And there's two ways to do that through a manual or an automated process. And then replatforming is really where you start to take advantage of some of the advanced capabilities that the cloud providers have built to optimize the performance of your individual workloads. SaaS would be replacing your apps with new cloud-based apps and then down at the bottom, anything that you want to move from a legacy app to a cloud native app would be refactored. Some of the application trends that we're seeing in the industry today is people leveraging a combination of the agile methodology for software development lifecycle with uh, um, CI and CD, so that would be your integration and your development along with leveraging the DevOps as an organization for rapid provisioning of environments to support your business apps. We already talked about the shift in the app, apps from perpetual to subscription-based, and then we're seeing a lot of increase in containerization and microservices. So things like Kubernetes and Docker are becoming widely uh, utilized as clients are working on their, their cloud applications and moving applications to the cloud. Where is the analytics industry going? Used to be everybody had very large centralized environments in their corporate data warehouses and enterprise data warehouses. And then the next wave kind of moved towards self-service leveraging uh, a lot of the reporting and analytic tools like Tableau and others for visualization. And then now what's really picking up some momentum is the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Many of you may not even realize when a client's using artificial intelligence and machine learning, but in a lot of our business applications today and customer self-service, um, some of that is, is working behind the scenes to uh, answer some of your questions through a self-service portal. Um, what's come with that is modern day analytics is comprised of all three waves. So most of you will end up with analytics in all three of these waves. You're not gonna eliminate any one of the earlier waves completely. And now the cloud is becoming pretty common because of the high volume of scale up and scale down uh, business needs for the, your, your data supporting your analytics. It's a perfect fit to leverage the cloud infrastructure and, and the public cloud now has many offerings to help you optimize the performance of that, such as Amazon's uh, Redshift platform and Azure data lakes. So relative to the survey, um, how many of you, where do you all see cloud analytics? You know, 30%, almost one third said it's extremely important. Um, almost another third said it's somewhat important. So 
65% of you said cloud analytics is a, is a key part of your analytics strategy. 17% haven't thought about it. 7% says it's not important. And 11% say they need more information to really make a decision on that. So what are some of the best practices you can leverage in your analytics? Um, like I said, um, cloud first analytics is moving very quickly to the cloud. Um, and the software vendors for analytics, both the back end and the front end, are releasing their new features and functions in their cloud versions before they release them in the legacy on-prem versions. So the gap between what you can run analytics in the cloud versus on-prem is going to continue to widen. Um, pretty common today for clients to um, stand up data lakes and modernize data warehouses. They usually replace a subset of what's on-prem, but not 100% of what's on-prem, or they build a new data lake from the ground up in the cloud. And then we also see usage of uh, POCs very important in your analytics space where you can test the back end, the data integration, the front end um, before you scale it up and before you roll it out to your business users. The use of PaaS. So where is each company in the survey today? You know, 28% said they will definitely leverage SaaS. 37, another 37% said that they will do a POC. The rest are, are likely not to use or, or will not use. So SaaS is pretty readily adopted. About 70, or PaaS is pretty readily adopted. About 70%. Um, cloud. Data man, cloud managed database platform. So these would be a data platform where you start to shift some of the responsibilities from your team or your database uh, outsourcer to the cloud provider. And 51% um, of you said you are considering leveraging these cloud managed platforms. And another just over a fourth said maybe, and almost 20% uh, said no. So as you can see, a lot of companies are seriously evaluating their cloud managed platforms, which matches the, the evolution slide that I had earlier in the deck. What are the most common data platforms out there? You know, this would match your industry install base. This is uh, from your survey results. So SQL Server being the largest, then Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, followed by some of the others. You know, what are the most popular database engines? This did not come from the survey. This came from an outside source. But this kind of tells you where the database market is going. So the databases that people are inquiring about the most are Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, Postgres, Mongo. We're seeing quite a few conversions from Oracle to Postgres today as clients are moving away from some of the licensing for Oracle. And those that are moving off the of SQL Server, the most common platform is, uh, is MySQL. So in the cloud modernization, you can kind of see where each of you who responded to the survey are in your modernization journey. 34%, um, almost a third, are remaining on your current database platforms as you move to the cloud. Whereas about 60% uh, are either leveraging cloud modernization, changing platforms, or seriously considering or evaluating it. What is one of the big drivers or trends in the database market is purpose-built databases. And you see some of those listed on the right-hand side. As different use cases perform better with different data structures, people are moving away from using one relational platform like Oracle or SQL Server and using uh, the best data platform for each business application as they develop the new applications. Some of the benefits that people get from managed databases from the cloud providers um, as I mentioned, leveraging those purpose-built databases and optimizing the performance of each workload, the overall, you know, just general cloud scalability, availability, the ability to reduce some of your license costs can be a big cost savings for you, and you remove some of the administrative responsibilities and have the ability to leverage serverless and cloud security. Who are some of the big cloud-managed options that are out there? On the left-hand side, you can see all the different managed options that AWS provides to you, quite a few across different workload types. As I mentioned, they're the furthest along in developing that. On the right, you can see what uh, Azure, MongoDB, and the most recent one that's entered the market is MySQL with a cloud-managed option. 
So when you look at the database market today in the cloud, um, this graphs the last three years, and you can see that the, the growth of man cloud managed platforms today for AWS is quite large. Microsoft is gaining a lot of momentum there. The other providers are, are um, growing at a much slower pace. So now let's kind of talk about what some of the overall results were to the survey. If I were to take a step back and summarize um, the big takeaways from the survey that each of you filled out, 70% of the companies have some workloads in the cloud today. And of those workloads, 75% of you are leveraging the public cloud and only 25% are leveraging a private cloud. 60% of you are in a hybrid mode where a subset of your workloads are in the cloud and the remainder on-prem. And 10% of you have moved all in on the cloud. Approximately, as I mentioned at the top of the call, 30% of the workloads are in the cloud today. And 50% of the companies say cloud costs are about what they expected. You know, the workloads that are moving fastest to the cloud are the database platforms. You know, per this Gartner data, it says 70% will be in the cloud in the next two years. Analytics and web content are the next fastest moving. We talked about some of the application trends around movement towards SaaS and organizations, internal IT organizations, taking advantage of DevOps, Agile, and CDCI to improve um, the speed at which they can release new business applications and support them for their business needs, and also the ability to de deploy them much faster and um, scale them up as the business needs scale. And then in the large enterprises, about 50, greater than 50% of you are using multiple cloud providers, which is consistent with what we see in the larger market here in the US. And middle small companies are less likely to leverage, leverage multiple cloud providers, tend to pick one private, one public cloud provider to put most of their workloads into. That's, uh, so less than 40% are multi-cloud. A high percentage of you are considering leveraging PaaS and over 60% are considering or using uh, modern data platforms as you move to the cloud. Some of the best practices that you can take advantage of, you know, it's really important as you move to the cloud to um, have a solid strategy plan and a roadmap and to think and leverage um, the, that advanced planning will save you time and will optimize um, the benefits that you get from the cloud providers as you move. Leveraging the 6R concept I talked about before for your application portfolio. Um, what most companies do is they look at their apps portfolio in buckets. So those buckets can either be all of the apps running on a particular environment in your data center in a hosted environment and wanting to move those um, in the similar time frame, so that you can decommission either your on-prem or your hosted environments, or they look at moving them based upon the data platform, like all the SQL Server workloads, followed by the MySQL workloads, et cetera, or they will look at moving them by business function. So all of the apps that are supporting a particular like sales and marketing to look at that portfolio and move, and then maybe move to financial apps, et cetera. So those are your, your may, um, main ways that clients look at their application portfolios to move. Um, database, as you're looking to move your workloads, it's really important. That's a good time to take a look at your data platforms and decide what are you going to just lift and shift and what are you going to try to modernize or move to a cloud managed platform. And that's usually done workload by workload. You're not going to do that across. You're not going to treat all your workloads the same. So there's some good, it's good best practice to put some planning into that and make decisions based upon each workload. Same with analytic roadmaps and POCs. Um, in your infrastructure space, clearly you need to put as much planning into your cloud infrastructure as you used to in planning your on-prem. And then your security and how you're going to um, manage security once you're in the cloud and manage your infrastructure once you're there. And then there are a lot of tools out there that you could use to help in your cloud migrations around schema conversion tools, migration tools. Many of these are provided by the public cloud providers and there's some third parties to help you accelerate your migrations to the cloud. 
Some other best practices are um, doing a benchmark of your cost and an ROI analysis and then measure after. Um, we talked about the importance of leveraging POCs. One thing that uh, we haven't mentioned, but many of the providers have uh, funding available depending upon the workloads that you're moving and whether a partner is helping you move those workloads or not. Based upon the competency of the partners, you get access to funding, and that's a way for you to decrease some of your cost of your migrations and also decrease some of your costs for the first year um, cloud bills. The next um, best practice is leveraging some of those partners who can help you make some of those key decisions around your applications, your databases, your analytics, your infrastructure, your security. And there's different partners out there that specialize in different areas and different workloads. But picking a good partner is a, an important way to, to uh, optimize your cloud journeys. And they also can help you teach your existing team how to leverage the cloud and how to manage the cloud environments if you want to in-house manage those platforms once you're in the cloud. And then finally is, you know, leveraging cloud managed services to um, service providers to help you optimize your consumption, security, performance, availability, et cetera. So now what I want to do is I'm going to have a couple of things that will be follow-up action items, and then we're going to get into some open Q&A. And I can see that several questions have already flowed into the portal. So if you have some questions, uh, please go ahead and enter them into the online um, conference app, and then we'll be able to start addressing some of those questions. Um, most of you took the survey, but those that have not, the survey is still out there and available, and we will release some additional results. There'll be a white paper forthcoming that summarizes um, a combination of the survey results, some of the trends we've talked about today, and some additional information. Um, and DBTA is going to have a um, evaluation of today's session, helps give us and them feedback on how valuable the session was today and how to make improvements in the future. It also allows you to uh, let them know if you're interested in some follow-up after today's conversation. There's a couple other things that you can do after today. Uh, feel free to email me if you'd like to have a one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with just your business and ourselves. We can talk about where you are in your cloud journey. We'll even take your survey results and say, how do you compare to the benchmarks that are out there and be open to answer any questions that you might have relative to your cloud strategies. There's no cost for that conversation. Um, feel free to link, connect with me on LinkedIn if you are interested. And then we have a white paper that will be released along with some other um, white papers, case studies, blogs, et cetera, that you can reach through the cloud migration and managed resources that would become available to you through uh, Datavel's uh, website. So now let's uh, take some questions. So I believe Stephen's been tracking some of the inbound questions. Um, Stephen, what's the first item on sure. people's mind? Okay, so first question, Dan, if, if you modernize, is it better to lift and shift than modernize or modernize as part of the migration? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, the, the, the real answer is it depends on your situation. So here's some of the schools of thought. If you have a very tight timeline to move to the cloud, and this can be driven based upon you know, uh, needing to get out of a co-lo co or hosted provider's environment or decommissioning a data center, then usually clients on a compressed timeline will lift and shift. And it's their fastest path to get to the cloud. If you don't have a compressed timeline and a deadline, then that's a good time to look at modernizing. And we see both. We see clients who will lift and shift and move to like EC2 in the AWS's world or to Azure and then go through a modernization process. But we also see some companies that decide to modernize as part of their migration. Uh, we have many uh, conversion projects underway today from SQL to MySQL or helping clients move from Oracle to Postgres. And those clients are either doing a lift and shift and then modernize or they're doing the modernization as part of the shift. Next question. Understood. Next question, are you seeing usage of private private clouds increasing or decreasing? 
So early on, um, a lot of companies were concerned about the security um, in the public cloud. And so there was a larger usage of private cloud. And many of your hosting providers are using private cloud as a way to protect their customer base and market share. But what's happened with the rapid advancement of security in the in the public cloud providers, it's hard for any on-prem or, or private cloud provider to keep up with the security advances at the pace that the public cloud providers. So we're seeing the usage of private cloud decreasing and the usage of pri uh, public cloud increasing. Understood. Our next question, how often are you seeing companies move workloads from the cloud back to on-prem? So it happens, but it's a small percentage of the time. Usually when it happens, it's when a workload has moved to the cloud and they didn't get the performance that they expected or the cost advantage that they expected. Um, some of these workloads were potentially not good candidates to move to the cloud in the first place, but they didn't go through that planning process. But, you know, migration from a public cloud back to a private or on-prem is a pretty rare occurrence these days. Understood. And uh, we just had a question come in. Private cloud, public cloud, or hybrid cloud, um, currently what is the most popular, in your opinion? Hybrid cloud is by far the most popular. Most companies are consider, um, planning to, to utilize public cloud and some leaving some of their applications on-prem or in a hosted environment. Um, that's about 60% of the market today. 10% um, of the companies are 100% in the cloud today. I think you're going to see that rapidly grow. Um, and a lot of small businesses are aggressively moving to the cloud and most brand new startups are launching cloud native. Understood. Uh, five years from now, do you think we'll mainly be seeing a lot of hybrid deployments or do you think public's going to tick up a whole lot? I think public's will tick up a lot. Um, really, if you think about it, you know, per Gartner's quote, 70% of the database workloads are going to be in the cloud in the next two years. I don't see people launching new workloads on-prem or in a hosted environment. I think you're going to see the new workloads host uh, launching in the cloud. And so I think your the uh, usage of hybrid cloud is going to greatly decrease as the existing workloads that are running today are, are moved to the public cloud. Understood. Our next question gets us into multi-cloud. Um, can you share some of the pros and cons of using multiple cloud providers? Okay, so in the large companies, I think the biggest driver to multi-cloud is not, in, not wanting to be locked into any one public cloud provider and wanting to diversify their spend and diversify their um, risk. So, you know, really large enterprises, it's pretty common to see a multi-cloud strategy. And then what they do is they try to identify logical workloads that should go to which cloud provider. And so they're pretty thoughtful in deciding what gets deployed and provisioned in AWS versus Azure versus maybe some Oracle workloads on Oracle or Google, analytics on Google. Um, I forget what was this repeats question. Let me make sure because I think maybe I missed part of that question. Sure. We, we were just kind of uh, looking for the pros and cons. Okay. So some of the cons of moving. So that's your biggest pro is to diversify your spend and diversify your uh, dependency. The, the, the biggest cons is complexity and cost. Each time you move to another provider, it adds complexity for your staff to stay current with that provider and their offerings. And each of the cloud providers are rapidly releasing new enhancements, and it's hard to stay current on all those enhancements. So I think the complexity of managing multiple cloud environments is why most medium-sized businesses and small businesses are trying to consolidate their workloads on a single public cloud, if at all possible, outside of their SaaS apps that, that the SaaS provider really takes offloads from you that need to manage those infrastructure environments. Understood. 
Our next question, if a company is going to modernize their databases, what are the most common platforms? No, that's a, that's a very good question. So AWS has done an excellent job of enhancing their RDS platform, so their relational database services platform, and Aurora, which is where you can run your Postgres and MySQL workloads. So that's probably the one that we see the most. And then as far as um, Azure SQL, a lot of clients that are Microsoft-oriented companies with a heavy investment in Microsoft are moving their workloads to Azure, but then also moving to the Azure managed SQL environment. As far as the database platforms itself, the ones that we see being consumed the most right now outside of the legacy relational databases of Oracle and SQL is uh, MySQL, uh, Postgres, and MongoDB. So those are the three that we see most often as uh, some of the modern platforms. And then you're seeing a lot of the other um, you know, use-case-based platforms like Graph and IoT and things like that are really niche today. Um, so their consumption is not as broad as, say, Mongo, MySQL, and Postgres are. Got it. Moving on to our next question, somewhat similar. Uh, what are the most common data platforms being used for cloud data lakes? Most common data platforms for cloud data lakes. So um, the biggest two right now is uh, Redshift um, from AWS. And then um, the, the Snowflake is pretty common. And then in the Azure space, it's the Azure data lakes. Um, Oracle has their autonomous data warehouse. It's newer, um, and so there's not as many companies that have leveraged the Oracle Autonomous, but it's starting to gain some traction in that uh, loyal Oracle uh, customer base. We're seeing a movement away from some of the legacy large warehouses like Teradata and uh, Netiza. So many of those, they'll stay in place, but as people move, they just redesign and rebuild and move to uh, something like a, a Redshift or a Snowflake as they make that move. Understood. Uh, autonomous databases is, is quite an interesting area and, and certainly relevant to a number of our subscribers and I suspect viewers today. Do you think we will see a rise in those types of capabilities as more companies invest in different types of cloud services and models? And, you know, what do you think the impact on that will be for for the folks that are, you know, have up, at least up until this point been in charge of managing those types of databases. Yeah, so clarification on the question is, um, are we thinking about Oracle's autonomous database or more um, data platforms as a whole becoming more self-managed platforms? Uh, I think a, Let a me bit answer. of both. Okay, so, you know, Let's talk about Oracle and where they are with their autonomous data, their autonomous platform. Um, you know, Larry Ellison's been pretty vocal about that's where he's taking Oracle's platform and to become, quote unquote, the self-managed uh, database platforms. Um, there's two flavors underneath Oracle's autonomous. One is for transactional system and one is for your, your analytic environments. Oracle's working really hard to enhance the capabilities of that platform and to make it more robust. Um, it still is not widely adopted, but I think as it gets more mature, you'll start to see it more adopted in that Oracle customer base. I think the non-Oracle workloads and even the Oracle workloads are going to start to move. They're moving faster to the other public cloud providers. And I think you're going to start to see clients look at ways to reduce the labor involved in managing their data platforms, whether it's through leveraging the cloud providers or leveraging an outside company to manage their data platforms for them so that they can focus more on their internal business needs. But I think that's a trend that's only going to accelerate um, from this point forward. I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Understood. Our next question, um, we have someone that's interested in understanding whether there are any significant cost differences and, and ROI differences between going with a private public or hybrid model. I'm guessing it probably depends on the circumstances, but if there's anything you'd like to weigh in there. Yeah, I, I think there definitely are some differences and it really comes down to not only your 
consumption of of wherever you're going to run your workloads but also your software licenses is a big piece of your spend and there's ways you can um, shift your workloads to change your licensing requirements from your database providers or move from a you know perpetual model into some open source software things like that um, so I think the the in my opinion the public cloud providers have sheer scale and volumes that are going to be hard for the private cloud providers to match and I think over time you're going to find the public cloud providers to be a lower cost option for you. So if you have workloads that you want to run in a private cloud, you may end up spending a little bit more for those, but you might have business reasons on why you want to keep them in private cloud. And same with your on-prem. I think it's going to be hard for companies' internal data center operation costs to be as optimized as the public cloud providers' costs are. So I think it will get more expensive over time as a smaller percentage of your workloads are remaining either in hybrid or, or private cloud. Understood. Do you think the popularity around hybrid cloud, at least right now, is it's kind of almost a stepping stone uh, for a lot of companies to get more into public cloud? Uh, repeat the question. Let me make sure I understood it right, Stephen. Are a lot of companies using hybrid cloud as somewhat of a stepping stone to get more fully into public cloud? Yep, absolutely. So, you know, it's a big undertaking to move 100% of your workloads to the cloud. So usually people put together the roadmap and a plan and they'll move it in phases. And so that's the biggest reason why there's hybrid cloud deployments. And I think you're going to continue to see that, um, you know, as people migrate the, the mix right now, it's 30% uh, public cloud, 70% on-prem or hosted. I think you're going to, at some point, we're going to pass the 50-50 point and things will, um, become more more cloud provided you know another thought i had back on your database modernization question before um, if you move your databases from your uh, traditional licenses to open source obviously you can greatly reduce your spend and that's one of the things that aws can help you do with their um, uh, rds and aurora environments understood uh, next question uh, Delving into NoSQL, uh, are there specific use cases that are a better fit for MongoDB's document database, and uh, why? Yeah, that's, a, that's an insightful question. Um, Mongo is probably one of the fastest growing database platforms today. They went public a couple of years ago, and if anybody tracked their stock price, you know, this year it's gone from $125 a share to over $250 a share, so it's over doubled just this year alone. And part of it is the industry analysts are very excited about Mongo's future growth potential. What I see is that um, two things are driving the consumption of Mongo. It is not a good, it, you can't replace all business applications with a relational database and move to the document database that Mongo has and expect them to perform well. But there are certain use cases that Mongo does extremely well with, like an e-commerce site. Um, if you think about a relational database with the high volume of tables and all the joins between the tables that your business application might have to do in the back end to service up information, the document platform makes it much faster to get information out of the out of the database and feed the feed something like an e-commerce engine or a booking engine for cruise ships or hotels. So those are pretty common use cases. We're also seeing a big uptick in IoT, where you've got some of that high volume of data. And then um, the, another reason Mongo's growing so fast is the developers love it. It's easier to write a business application on top of Mongo than it is with all of the architecture and planning you have to do on the database of a relational database. But like I said, you got to be careful and make sure you're picking a use case that really the document database will perform well. So not everything would be a good fit for it. But there are reasons why Mongo is doing so well in the market today. Understood. We're just about at the top of the hour, uh, Dan. Before we break, um, any additional thoughts, uh, things you'd really like our viewers today to walk away keeping in mind? I guess the final thought I would have is um, there's no doubt that cloud is going to become more and more important to each of your businesses. Um, take the time to plan your journey and think down at the workload level 
and what's the best way to handle each of those workloads and then work closely with your your public cloud provider and their partners to make those moves and migrations and you'll have a you'll have a very successful experience and then you know be careful about provisioning stuff and then just leaving it and not monitoring it you know many times when we get into a client and the client's frustrated with their cloud consumption their cloud cost scaling it's because they haven't monitored their consumption and they haven't done things to manage their consumption um, like they would if it had been a legacy on-prem environment and that's probably the most common thing and then the other is don't think don't forget about your software licenses there is a big lever to be pulled there if you can find ways to optimize some of your software spend understood but hopefully uh Hopefully the survey um, was helpful for you to see where you stand up against your, your peer groups. Um, we're welcome to have a conversation with each of you one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll produce a white paper and some other artifacts that might be of value to you as you plan your, your cloud journeys. Absolutely, that was uh, fantastic. And everyone, please stay on. Um, once this event closes, you will be directed to a quick survey. We appreciate your feedback. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our speaker today, Dan Russell, Senior Vice President of Cloud Strategy and Alliances at DataVail. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you use for today's live event. It will be archived, and you will receive an email once the archive is posted. And just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on October 30th. We will reach out to you via email if you are the lucky viewer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon.